We did a recap of last week. Now let's do just a very quick recap of everything we did to date in the course. So we learned what is a mechanism, what it means to implement something with a mechanism, implementation. We talked about how to implement the efficient allocation. So we, the efficient mechanisms is something that we talked about. We have BCG, generalized BCG, AGV, and so on. And we talked about how to implement an arbitrary social choice function. Test, test it with monotonicity and then use the retrovelation mechanism. Now let's take a little break from implementing arbitrary social choice functions. We will get back to that in a couple of weeks with a specific question there. But now let us talk for the remainder of this week and also the next lecture about optimal mechanisms or also known as revenue maximizing mechanisms. Or I guess it's the other way around. Revenue maximizing mechanisms, also known as the optimal mechanisms. I will do it in three parts, where the largest part will be the second one. And this will happen next lecture. Today, we will start with a very simple example, just as we sometimes do. We will start with a very simple example that will be easy to solve, but it will be very insightful. And next lecture, we will see how these insights carry over to a more general model. And the model that I, or the problem that we will be talking about today, is something that you have probably seen in IO literature, or game theory, or micro, some of the micro courses. And it is called monopolistic screening. And it also has another name, which is second degree price discrimination. So basically, the setting is as follows. We have a designer who is a seller of the item in this case. We're jumping a bit between seller designer and seller player. But in this case, seller is the designer. So this seller can interact with, let's say, one buyer for today. And this seller can offer a menu to this buyer, a menu of quantities and prices corresponding to these quantities. Offers a menu of KT, just to keep the notation the same. So this will be quantity of the item traded. T will be the price for all of them, for the whole quantity. And let us say that the seller actually has some production costs. Production cost C of K equal just K square. So again, we can interpret this cost as the preference of the designer. So it will be equal to minus V0 of a given K. Now, in principle, in richer models, you can think that the seller has some private information, for example, about his costs, about his technology level. But as a reminder, we do not do that in mechanism design, because the informed principle models are very, very difficult. So, seller's costs are known. And we have one buyer. with valuation C 
theta for i term. And the simplicity of today's example is that we will assume that this valuation is binary. So it's either low or high, L or H. And this is per item or per unit. And of course, as usual in the mechanical design problem, this valuation is privately known by the buyer, so it is not known to the seller. Private. We will assume some distribution of this valuation. So we will assume that the probability of a high valuation is given by some phi. That's a beautiful notation, so I denote the whole distribution by phi. I denote the probability of the high type by phi. Don't get lost in it. And phi of L will be 1 minus phi. Buyer's utility is given by UI. But it's not in I, right? Let's call it U1, you can call it UB, doesn't really matter. You can just call it U if you remember that there are costs. Let's say U1. No, let's say UB. It's, it's a little better. Of theta is just Euclidean. So, as I said, it's per valuation per, per unit. Or item is a little misleading. So, the utility is k theta minus t. So, again, environment check. Does this define a proper environment? Finish underlining everything on the valuation utility. Okay. Let's go down the checklist. Players. One plus the designer. Types. Valuation theta, binary. Three. Outcome. Yeah, outcome. Quantity and price, K and T, quasi linear setting. Utilities, four. Cost and buyer's utility. And these four kind of give us the environment in which we can design a mechanism. So everything works out, we are happy. A question for you, again, to answer. Is this a Euclidean setting? Does this fit into the description of the Euclidean setting that we had before? Maybe not because the seller has non-linear utility. You are correct. So in quasi-linear setting, this V0 should have been also linear, multiplicative. That's right. Although I can't remember whether we put restrictions on designer steps. No. Player steps definitely should be linear. Because that's how we that's where we get monotonicity from and revenue equivalents. When we were talking about Euclidean, didn't we consider one-dimensional outcome space? Close. We considered one-dimensional allocation. So allocation should have been a number for every player. But we also had transfers there. right? So this part fits the description, because k here is just a number. It's quantity produced. Good. Let me maybe start on your line. Any other? Uh, comments, any other answers for why this is not the Euclidean setting that we consider? <laughs> we have one. Very good. The set of types theta should be convex in the Euclidean setting because we take, well, we integrate over the type space, and to make it uh, nicer, we assume that the type space is one dimensional and convex, so just an interval in the real line. Uh, is there anything else? I think that's it. I think that's it. So this is not quite a Euclidean setting, but it's close enough. Although the fact that thetas are uh, yeah, not, not, an, not an interval will 
will imply that we cannot invoke ready here from this directory. So we'll have to do something else with that. The question here, what is the goal? What are we designing? What is the mechanism? Our seller this time around is finally the self-interest economic agent that we often assume them to be. So our seller would like to maximize the expected profit. So the question is, what is the revenue maximizing mechanism? Profit maximizing. Profit, not revenue. For these two lectures, whenever I say revenue maximization, you should absolutely think about profit maximization. We never, really, we never ignore the costs. So what is the profit maximizing mechanism? If we have to write this down as an optimization problem, we actually can this time around because the setting is concise enough. So let us do exactly that. We want to find such k and t, or such a menu of k and t, and by the revelation principle, which does actually hold here, we can just look at these as a function of theta. So we'll have a mechanism such that the buyer reports his type to the mechanism and gets some k and t. Gets an offer of some volume of the products at price t. And actually, let me just change that a little bit. To make writing this all on the board a little bit faster, I will let k subs. I will put types from brackets to subscripts. So k subscript theta is the same as k of theta. T subscript theta is the same as T of theta. So our seller wants to find such K theta and T of theta for every virus type, all of the two of them, to maximize the expected profit. So we can write this as expected over theta transfer T that the buyer pays to the mechanism i.e. to the seller, minus the cost of producing that given t, given k, this t theta, minus the cost k theta squared. And just to write out the expectation more explicitly, because we have a distribution of thetas, we can rewrite this as following. We have phi times t h minus k h squared plus 1 minus phi times t l minus k l squared. So everyone agrees that this is the expected profit of the seller. And now do we have any constraints on what k's and t's we should use? Well, I will not even ask you. Of course we do, because otherwise our lives would be just too simple. But what kind of constraints do we have here? What are our permanent... What is our permanent set of constraints in this course? Individual rationality constraints. So this is something that... Yeah, we, we will assume in this problem it's not the permanent thing. So sometimes we have it in this course, sometimes we don't. We have something else that is more ever present, Rasmus? It needs to be incentive compatible. Yeah, that is very right. So we will have incentive compatibility constraints and incentive rationality constraints. So how many of each? Let's look. So let's fix the high type. How many possible deviations does the type have? Does the high type have in this in this environment? Just one. He can misreport his type as low, but nothing else. So we will have one incentive compatibility condition for the high type, which looks as yeah, theta h. There I wrote h. Now I'm writing theta h. Let's yeah, let's uh, make this theta. 
spaces to just have the types in the subscript always. So theta L, theta H, we have five theta L, theta H. The other way around. Good. I was testing you. <laughs> All right. And everything else should be the same. All right, so we have theta h times k h minus th must be greater than or equal to what? You tell me. Theta h times kl minus tl. So by misreporting his type, the high type gets volume kl at price tl, but his value per unit is still theta h. So we have a similar incentive compatibility condition for the low type. So theta L times KL minus TL must be greater than or equal to theta L times KH minus TH. That's it for IC conditions. Now the two individual rationality conditions for the high type. How will it look like? If their outside option is zero, if the buyer's outside option is zero. I guess we, we did miss that part when specifying the environment. I guess, yeah, it, it's not, outside options are not a permanent place in the environment. We do not always specify them because sometimes we do not care about individual rationality. But if we do, then we should specify them. Okay. How does IR condition look for the high type? Exactly. The utility that the high type gets in equilibrium should be weakly positive. But the high type gets in equilibrium if it tells the truth. And the same for the low type. IR for the low type, theta L, KL minus TL should be weakly positive. Good, then let's solve it. This looks a lot more pleasant and a lot more concrete than everything we had in the course so far. This is something that we can actually solve, that you should be able to solve given your prior knowledge. How would, you, how would you approach it? What would be the canonical way to do this? The way you were taught in, in your uh, math for economists classes. OK, a, a simple question. How would you solve an unconditional maximization problem? Take a first order conditions, yeah. Well, then I guess check whether the second order conditions hold and so on. If you have just an equality constraint, how would you do it then? Lagrangian, yes. You, s you use Lagrange method, you set up a Lagrangian, so you write up this expression plus some Lagrange coefficient times the constraint. You take a first order condition of that, take, make sure second order condition holds, and you treat the uh, Lagrange variable as any other variable. Good. Now, once you have an inequality constraint, how do you do that? Kuntaka, yeah. It's more or less the same thing as the Lagrangian, except you have more conditions. So you have the condition that Lagrange constraint, Lagrange multiplier times this constraint must be equal to zero. Something like that. So if we do that here, we would have the objective function plus four restrictions with four unknown variables. So we have a total of four k thetas, two thetas, plus four of these constraints. So we have eight conditions. Uh, we have to treat different cases depending on whether these conditions are binding or not. So whether the respective multipliers are zero or positive. Does that ring a bell? Is that, is that familiar? Some people are annoying, but some people are utterly, utterly saddened by seeing this. So this is something that you should be, that you would be expected to be able to solve as an economist, at least using that method. Using the proper method is, however, messy, as we have just argued. So maybe there is something better that we can do. And of course, we wouldn't be here if there weren't. And the reason, actually, the whole reason I'm presenting this problem to you is that this is a quite a 
popular problem, maybe with a different cost function. But for this particular problem, with two types and these four constraints, there is a relatively set recipe of how you can solve it. So we will walk through this recipe now. Step one is to show that incentive compatibility of the high type and individual rationality for the low type imply IR H. Meaning that what we are showing with that is that these, if these two conditions hold, then this condition will hold automatically. So we can just drop it from our problem and forget about it because it will be satisfied automatically. So let's do that. Let me write out these conditions here. Theta h minus th minus th will be weakly greater than theta h kl minus tl. This is incentive compatibility of the high type. Theta l kl minus tl will be weakly positive. And this comes from the individual rationality of the low type. Yeah. So what happens then? How can we show exactly? If you look at these two expressions, you can see that this one, that they differ only in thetas. And we have assumed, implicitly at least, that theta h is greater than theta L, that the high valuation is higher than the low valuation. So then this chain of inequalities tells us that the high types utility in the equilibrium from truth telling is greater than something, greater than something, greater than something, greater than zero. So it is greater than zero, meaning that this chain of inequalities does yield us the IRH. Good. So step one, done. Step two, show that incentive compatibility of the high type and incentive compatibility of the low type imply that KH will be greatly greater than KL. How do we do that? We should add the two inequalities together, or maybe subtract. Let's add them together. So. So this was ICH, and here we'll have IC of the low type, theta L, KL minus TL is greater than theta L, KH minus TH. And if we sum them together, we have, I'm just rearranging things a little bit. So bring terms with theta h to the left hand side. I'll have theta h kh minus kl from here minus tl minus th will be weakly greater than theta l times kh minus kl minus tl minus th. All right, cool. You see that both sides have minus TL minus TH. So we can cancel them out. And we see exactly that. Well, I guess rearranging things one more time. Theta H minus theta L times KH minus KL must be weakly positive. We know that this. Difference is positive, therefore KH must be really greater than KL. And does this second step remind you of anything? Something that we have been talking for the past two weeks. It is exactly the monotonicity result for our not quite Euclidean setting, for our particular problem. 
It's just we do not really have that minus easy result because we are not exactly in the Euclidean setting, setting, so we have to prove it again. But this is more or less exactly that. Now, step three is to use this monotonicity and to show that this condition on our optimal quantities and if the incentive compatibility of the high type is binding then incentive compatibility of the low type holds. I'm using slightly more words here because this statement is now slightly different. It says that well, if this condition is binding, then this one holds. So not only this ICH holds, but it holds with equality. And now how do we do that? So let's try and see. Let's write out the ICH in the binding form. We know that theta H, KH minus TH will be equal to theta H, KL minus TL. And we need to bring it to IC of the low time. Yeah, let's put all the allocations to the left hand side, all transfers to the right hand side. And maybe that will work. I'm actually not 100% sure on how this works. Oh, yeah, okay, I see it now. So this is just rewriting the IC of the high time. And from here, we can plug this difference of transfers into the IC of the low type. So IC of the low type is written as theta L, KL minus TL greater than theta LKH minus TH. And we can rewrite that as, so we have TH minus TL, TH minus TL on the left hand side greater than theta L times KH minus KL. And then plug this difference of transfers in there. And if we do that, what we obtain is exactly kind of the same form that we had from Antonis. Theta H times the difference of K's is greater than theta L times the difference of K's. Which therefore holds if this difference is positive. Holds if KH is greater than KL because theta H is greater than theta L. Yeah, so this was just to state it. We did not know. We did not know that this ICL was holding at the point that we wrote it, but we showed that it does hold in the end. Cool. One final step towards solving this problem is that we need to show that our IC for the high type binds just as we assumed in condition 3. So we need to show that this was not all in vain, that we will actually use it. And then we'll also show that IR of the low type must also bind. And this, yeah, this is kind of two steps in one. So let's try to think how can we show that. Let us take the approach in which we fix some quantities k, and we are trying to find out the well some quantities k that satisfy this inequality, as they should. And we are trying to play around with the transfers. TH and TL. So fix some KH greater than KL and select 
optimal TH and TL. Obviously, what are the optimal transfers? Our profits depend positively on transfers, so we want to put to set T's as high as possible. So you can say that we want to select maximal pair of transfers, which satisfy all of the constraints that we have here. But we already know a few things. Firstly, we know that we can ignore IR of the high type. And I guess we cannot really ignore IC of the low type. And I guess we can just look at these two. So let's try to find best TH and TL given these two. Let's start with IR of the low type. We know that theta L times KL minus TL must be weakly positive. Weakly positive, yeah. So suppose it is strictly positive. Then it means that we can increase TL and this IR of the low type will still hold. Increase TL. Ah, sorry, I chose the wrong one to start with. So let's leave this at this and look at the other expression first. I knew there was a, some particular order in which we had to look at them, but I guess wrong. So ICH. Suppose, again, it, it is not binding. It holds uh, strictly. So theta H, KH minus TH, strictly greater than theta H, KL minus TL. Then it means that we can increase TH without violating AC of the high type. But this is not the only constraint that we need to satisfy, so let's see what also happens with the other three constraints. So ICH still holds. We know that IRH also holds because we are kind of assuming that we started with, uh, here we are assuming that this is the optimal mechanism and we're, we will come to a contradiction with the statement. So if IRH was holding, it was holding strictly, because actually this inequality on types is strict, meaning that IR H was slack, therefore it still holds. And then what about the low type? If you look at the IC of the low type, if we increase TH, it only becomes slack. It, it is easier to satisfy this constraint. Therefore, if it was holding, it still holds. I see L still holds. And for IR of the low type, TH does not even enter it. So it does not, it is not affected by our small manipulation. IR L still holds. So I'm not writing this here, but the logic of this manipulation is suppose we had an optimal mechanism in which I see of the high tech was slack. Then we found a profitable deviation for the designer, which increases expected profit and satisfies all the constraints. So we did that. Therefore, we conclude that I see of the high type binds in the optimal, in the optimal mechanism. And now we can get back to IR of the low type in the very last minute. So here what we actually want to do is, again, 
Suppose that in the optimal mechanism, IR of the load type is slack. And let us increase both transfers by the same amount. By same epsilon. And now we're running out of time. But the logic here is exactly the same. You show that none of the constraints are affected by this manipulation. And so they still hold. But again, you're increasing TH, so you're increasing the expected profit. So this is a profitable deviation from the optimal mechanism. So same logic or analogous logic leads us to conclude that IR binds. And so why did we do all that? We did all that to solve this problem. We did not actually solve it, but we have simplified it to a great extent. We showed that we can completely ignore IR of the high type, IC of the low type, so we have two less constraints to worry about, and the other two are equality constraints rather than inequality constraints. So we have simplified the problem by a lot. It is now much easier to solve. And at this point, you can either use the Lagrangian or you can express and plug in some of the variables. We will probably do that very quickly next week. Or maybe I'll maybe do it at home. This will be your only homework for next time. So please do this. And uh, for the final remarks, yeah. OK, I will not talk about the properties of this optimal mechanism. We will start next lecture by stating what exact properties are, because they all concern these uh, constraints. But the big takeaway here, so the big change of this optimal mechanism topic from what we did before, is that we no longer have a fixed allocation k that we want to implement. But rather, now we are selecting the allocation k together with the transfers. So this is the big change in philosophy now from previous parts. OK, so we will stop here.